If I give them cause to think I'm even remotely in love with you, they'll send me to hell. Forever! Oh no! I'm sorry, what? What is this train of thought? <laughs> what? No one can know you came from Maine. No one! <laughs> Hi everyone, we're at it again. Um, my name is Carrie, welcome to my channel. Thank you for being here today. We are entering, we've already been here, but we are re-entering our Fallen Angels era. Um, I was definitely a vampire girly uh, when it comes to YA. I was definitely raised in the golden era of dystopian fantasy or just dystopian YA fiction in general. I kind of missed the Fallen Angels thing. Um, I was in the Shadowhunter world, as we know. I missed kind of everything else, I feel like. And when talking with my friends or talking with people online, the series that keeps coming up, the cult classic, the underground favorite, is the Hush Hush series. I have never in my life touched this book. I have never seen one in the flesh. I have never been in a bookstore or a library where I have actually seen these books. I am so fresh. I know nothing except that there is literally a falling angel on the cover. I think when I first heard of Hush Hush, it was when I was doing my book boyfriend video and I kept getting, I don't even remember the name, but I just kept getting people voting for someone from Hush Hush. And so here I am to read this series with you. And um, it's four books. Well, I'll get into it, but before I fully dive in to uh, another one of these videos that I love making so much, don't get me wrong. And once again, going into this, I know nothing. There is no hatred in my heart. I am just giving you my reactions. If I don't like it, it's not because I was going into this hoping to shit on your favorite series. It's just because I didn't like it and that's okay. Um, just trying to give my feelings. If you liked it, I'm really glad that it took you on a journey because every book is different for every person and that's great and that's what makes the world go round. So with that disclaimer aside, I want to give a shout out to the sponsor of this video, which is Blinkist, and it actually ties perfectly in because a lot of you guys watch these kind of videos because you simply do not have the time to commit to reading. I'm probably going to be reading over a thousand pages within this week, and that's not normal. <laughs> So Blinkist is actually a really wonderful service that takes your favorite nonfiction books, condenses them, and gives you basically the most important information within 15 minutes. So that's like a short commute to work. They have over 6,500 titles, um, including nonfiction books and podcasts that they summarize for you. They have some of my personal favorites like Sapiens, which is a book that I highly recommend, but also understand that it's difficult to find time to read. And something I'm interested in trying out is they have quite a few self-help books, which I, that's the genre I cannot get into. I have not found a self-help book that clicks with me and I think that having them shortened down would really be helpful. And they also have a feature called Blinkist Spaces where you can actually invite your friends and family and you can share titles that you recommend and everyone within that space has access to the titles and they don't need the premium subscription. So if you're interested in trying it out, uh, there is a link in the description box. You can get a seven day free trial plus 60% off of your annual premium subscription. Thank you so much to Blinkist for sponsoring this. Again, information will be down in the description box. And now off to my version of summarizing things, which is not putting things into 15 minutes. It is taking hours of your time. So now let me figure out what I'm actually getting myself into. Hold on. Here we go. The Hush Hush Quartet, four books, is a series that follows teenager Nora Gray as she falls in love with the fallen angel Patch and discovers her own angelic heritage, Patch. That was the name. Patch. So this came out in 2009. It has a 3.93 star rating on Goodreads with almost 700,000 ratings. All right, I love it when things start out with capital letters. Here we go. A sacred oath, a fallen angel, a forbidden 
love. Romance was not part of Nora Gray's plan. She's never been particularly attracted to the boys at her school, no matter how hard her best friend V pushes them at her. Not until Patch comes along. Patch. I just can't get over that name. With his easy smile and eyes that seem to see inside her, Patch draws Nora to him against her better judgment. But after a series of terrifying encounters, Nora's not sure whom to trust. Patch seems to be everywhere she is and seems to know more about her than her closest friends. This doesn't sound good. She can't decide whether she should fall into his arms or run and hide. Oh gosh. And when she tries to seek some answers, she finds herself near a truth that is way more unsettling than anything Patch makes her feel. For she's right in the middle of an ancient battle between the immortal and those that have fallen. And when it comes to choosing sides, the wrong choice will cost Nora her life. <laughs> oh my goodness. These covers are incredible. Is Hush Hush inappropriate? Because Hush Hush is more about physical attraction than romance, this book would probably be best for older young adult readers. <laughs> okay, I don't want to- are there trigger- no, I don't actually want to look up the trigger warnings. That, I'm going in- I'm going in fresh. I'm going to begin, shall I? I'll read you the first- hold on, let me get it. Okay, prola- Wait a second. The prologue, if I'm looking at it correctly, takes place in 1565. Is Patch over 500 years old? Over 400 years old, I can't do math. No. <laughs> okay, okay, so the prologue starts with a French boy named Chauncey walking around his house. He's running home, doo -doo 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 -doo, and then this naked, half naked boy with peasant trousers lying low on his waist. He is like, hey man, your dad's actually an angel, so you're half fallen angel, half human, and you need to bow down to me and swear your fealty to me. And he does like mind control and so Chauncey like kneels and agrees to be loyal to this half-naked boy. And that's how it ends. And now we are present day in Maine. I walked into biology and my jaw fell open. Mysteriously adhered to the chalkboard was a Barbie doll with Ken at her side. What? <laughs> the book starts off with, um, our girl, I suppose, walking into sex ed. Let's just read this damn book, shall we? Hush, hush. Let's find out what makes Patch, Patch. <laughs> Gotta love 2009 writing. So she's talking about her best friend V. She's green eyed, minky blonde, and a few pounds over curvy. I'm a smoky eyed brunette with volumes of curly hair that holds its own against even the best flat iron. And I'm all legs, like a bar stool. <laughs> Okay, so they have to change seats in class. He's making a new seating chart. And I understand the outrage. That was like changing a seating chart was life altering in, in school. So I completely understand. So she's kind of freaking out, but now she has to sit next to the one person in class she doesn't know the name of, the transfer. Coach, her teacher, never called on him. He seemed to prefer it that way. He sat slouched one table back, cool black eyes holding a steady gaze forward. I didn't for one minute believe he just sat there day after day staring into space. He was thinking something, but my instinct told me I probably didn't want to know what. So she introduces herself like, hi, I'm Nora. And his black eyes sliced into me. The corners of his mouth tilted up. My heart fumbled a beat. And in that pause, a feeling of gloomy darkness seemed to slide like a shadow over me. His smile wasn't friendly. It was a smile that spelled trouble with a promise. Ew, he smells like cigars. Hard pass. That's like my least favorite smell in the world. Boop. Okay, okay. So this dude comes in strong. He is the opposite of Edward Cullen, okay, in biology class. They have to learn about each other. They have to like talk to each other, talk to a new student, and like write down new things about them. And he just immediately starts writing a ton of shit and he's never spoken to her. So she's like, what on earth? And he's like, yeah, I know that you play the cello. You like to eat organic. You are, you know, doing this, that, and the other thing, blah, 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 blah. Like so dead on. And he's like really aggressive. Like he keeps grabbing her chair and pulling her closer to him. We find out that she is in therapy, but it's forced. She didn't choose to go. She lives with her mom because her dad got murdered. 
weird. And then when like the class bell rings and they leave, she realizes that she hasn't been able to ask him any questions. So she's like, hey, wait a second, come back here. And then he just writes his phone number on her hand. She watches him walk away. He had an annoyingly confident walk. The kind that you find paired with faded t-shirts and a cowboy hat. What? Patch wore neither. He was a dark Levi's, dark Henley, dark boots kind of guy. If he's massive, she didn't really describe him, but if he's like a massive man, he is 100% straight out of an Allie Hazelwood <laughs> book. Uh-oh. He's cute, even though his eyes are black orbs. <laughs> Okay, so her mom is constantly out of the house for work, and she doesn't ever feel scared because she feels some kind of presence. Is Patch her guardian angel? Is Patch the strange presence? Anyway, she went to try to get answers from him after school. He was like at a pool hall arcade thing, and he's just like a creep. He's like, I've never been to school. I only came to school to see you. That's why I know everything about you is because I'm obsessed with you. And just red flags. <laughs> okay, now Girlie is driving home. Her friend V drove her. They like went to the movies and the library together. V drives herself home in her car. And then Nora is like, what, you aren't gonna drive me home? And V is like, sorry, I don't like the fog around your house. So take my car, drive yourself home. Thanks, V. So anyway, she's driving, Nora is driving herself home alone to her house where her mother is not there. And it's really foggy and rainy and crazy. And all of a sudden she hits somebody, but he's not injured and he's wearing a ski mask and he starts to rip her car door off and like punch his way through her driver's seat window and grabs her. And luckily she's able to speed off in time. Also, I'm not going to go into it, but it is very uh, 2009 scripted in a way that like there's definitely, you know, the best friend is a few pounds over curvy. So like her whole thing is people make fun of her for being overweight and we don't like the girls that wear a lot of foundation, so on and so forth. I'm not going to really touch on that because I feel like we know that early, like this era of young adult fiction, we know. She decides to turn around and go back to V's house and sleep there because she doesn't want to sleep alone. And her car is mysteriously totally fine and she can't remember a thing about the guy except that his eyes were black like Patch. Yeah, so like I said, I'm not going to continue to point this out, but her best friend V is like constantly on a diet and like every time V is mentioned her diet is mentioned and it's just also the hatred of curly brown hair that we had to live through good lord anyway V finds out Patch's last name lord knows how and she tries to help Nora get into the student record area so that she can like look up stuff on Patch because he might be stalking her so she's allowed to stalk him back. In order to get Nora into the student record room, V called in a bomb threat from the payphone outside in 2009. Uh-oh, Patch called her angel and I'm pretty sure he knows that she's an angel and I only know this because of the Goodreads summary, so... Just as I was thinking that this reminded me of like reverse Twilight, we've got like a transfer student and blah blah blah. They have a baseball game and Patch is like speaking to her like telepathically and telling her when to swing. <laughs> Such a weird detail. Anyway, there's this new guy named Elliot who has transferred from the prep school nearby, like the private school, and he seems really attracted to Nora. And he asked, Patch asked Nora to go to this like bonfire party thing on the coast. And she said no, because Patch is like potentially a big old creep. But Elliot asked her and V and she said yes. So who do we think is also going to be at the party? Like, I don't think she put two and two together. 
Okay, they're at the carnival, the boardwalk, whatever, and she rides a ride with Patch. Her seatbelt comes off. She flings out of the car, is on the roller coaster tracks, and somehow then suddenly she's like back in the car and nothing is wrong. And, um, <sighs> called it. Okay, so I'm a third of the way through, and here's the thing. Um, with, I'm going to choose to compare this to Twilight and the Shadowhunters because I feel like they are somewhat within the same family, let's say. Um, the thing with the moody, kind of mean, you shouldn't be friends with me, you should stay away from me kind of love interests with Edward and Jace, they at least had like a reason. The the female protagonist had some reason to stick with them. M Bella, questionable, but like with the Shadowhunter world in the Mortal Instruments, if you're interested, you can watch my full plot recap and yes, Right after this, I will start working on finishing that series, so don't worry. The reason that Clary is stuck hanging out with kind of asshole Jace is because she just discovered a completely new world, her mother is missing, he is her only connection to the world, so she has to kind of like stay with him and find her mother, solve this mystery. With Bella, she, do she also doesn't really have a big reason to be hanging out with Edward, but Patch just seems like there he's just kind of like a skeevy asshole, like he's hot, but he also might be stalking her and like is just really weird. There's no reason other than this like weird attraction she has to him there's no other reason to like be hanging out with him so it's just I'm just not buying it yet I'm waiting for a reason for them to actually be hanging out other than like oh it's a hot guy that's treating her really badly show me something patch give me something oh and now she's a fucking redhead Ah. So somehow all of her friends abandon her at the boardwalk and so Patch drives her home on his motorcycle and then he just lets himself into her house and starts making her tacos. Once again, she's completely alone in her house because her mom and her housekeeper are not there. I just... Ooh. What a sentence. <laughs> what? Now Nora feels like she is being followed, but not by Patch, probably by the crazy ski mask person who broke her car. So they're shopping and V is like, well, why don't I dress up as you and I go as like a decoy and then you follow the person who's following me, which sounds like a bad idea. And then V gets attacked and her arm is broken and she needs surgery. Okay. School got a new psychologist, so she goes to meet her and she seems like sus. I don't know. She gives off weird vibes. And then out of the blue, she's like, by the way, it says in your file that you're going to start tutoring Patch because uh, whatever, it was mentioned. Anyway, um, and she's like, you need to stay away from him, but I can't discuss why. Um, okay. And now we discover that Elliot was questioned for a murder at his former school. Okay, Nora goes to Patch's workplace and she interrogates the bartender. She, go, she goes in disguise, by the way, and she interrogates the bartender being like, can you get a job here if you have a felony? Because she's convinced that Patch is some kind of criminal. And she also asks if he has a girlfriend and Patch is like, why don't you just ask me? And I guess the ex is dead okay so patch's name is patch because he was into boxing and he wasn't good at it so people had to patch him up all the time nurses friends you get it so anyway they're on like a weird date he brought her to the cigar pool hall and she also had somebody possibly break into her house but once again everything was put back perfectly except for the article she printed out about Elliot being a murder suspect that was taken from her room and then she went to the library she had this weird girl fight body shaming in both directions with the mean girl Marcy and then Patch saw that that happened and then the next morning Marcy apparently got beat up right after that whole interaction so who did it and that's all <laughs> okay Bella Swan um 
she noticed like he got in this fight with a friend at the pool hall and his shirt kind of rode up in the back and she noticed that he has a scar stretching right where angel wings should be so she's immediately like oh all right let's google this and we're getting close yep guilty elliot's a villain elliot is a villain oh my gosh so elliot shows up and like attacks her like physically attacks her because he wants to go camping with her and she said no and it's very obvious now that like she doesn't trust him and Elliot gets really pissed and instead of telling her mom she's like oh he wanted my notes and he cheated off of me come on uh, oh my god so this is becoming a murder mystery investigation so Nora goes to the other city where the prep school is to try and scope out like what did Elliot really do learn about this murder, which some people think is a suicide. And as she's there, of course, she gets like lost and then in trouble and she loses her coat and her cell phone and blah, blah, blah. She finds a payphone. She manages to get Patch to pick her up. His car dies, so they can't drive home. And the only option, but and, and his cell phone is dead too, somehow. Um, The only option is to stay in a seedy hotel. Motel. Excuse me. So she touches his scar, okay? Cause they both needed to shower because it was so cold, blah, blah, blah. So she sees him shirtless, touches his angel wing scar and is sucked into this memory where they're back at the arcade and Patch is meeting with Mrs. Green, AKA Nora's new school therapist right basically yes patch is a fallen angel mrs green is like her name is debria debria is like i know how you can get your wings back you just need to become a guardian angel and save one life and patch apparently is like i already know how to get my wings back i have a different plan and apparently the higher ups the other angels don't want him to go through with whatever his plan is so they're like no we really need you to be a guardian angel who does he need to guard Nora Gray, you guessed it. And someone's trying to kill her. And Debra has this vision. She's like, I can't see who it is. Oh wait, there's the shadow. Um, it's you, Patch. So he needs to be her guardian angel to save her from him killing her. Oh my God. So yeah, he has been trying to kill her. <laughs> I thought it was a misunderstanding, but like, oops, he actually was. <laughs> okay, so Patch just wants to become human. He doesn't want to be an angel anymore. So he, that's why he didn't want to take the guardian angel route. And the only way to become human is apparently to kill his vassal, which is Chauncey from the prologue. And wouldn't you know it, Nora is a descendant. And apparently you gotta kill one of the female descendants in order to become human. So that's why he wants to kill her. And there we go. Also, Daria, AKA Mrs. Green is the one who's been stalking her and hurting V and stuff like that. Okay, so Patch, da Daria, what's her name? Da da anyway, that girl, Mrs. Green, um, tries to kill Nora. Nora fights back, Patch comes to the rescue. He's like, take my car, drive somewhere, and I'll take care of this lady who he apparently like rips her wings off and now she's like out of the picture, whatever. We're returning to the fact that V went to a party with Elliot and his mysterious friend Jules who I haven't really mentioned, but he's just like a weirdo that is never around, but somehow V is also low-key dating him. I don't know. So we've been searching for V, can't find her until she calls and is like, hey, we're playing hide and seek at the high school. Why don't you come? Elliot wants to talk to you. She passes the phone and Elliot is like, if you don't come play hide and seek, I'm like, there's a tree with V's name on it at the school. And the person that he was suspected of murdering died because she was hung from a tree. So, what? Mm, so, turns out Jules is Chauncey. Anyway, he's also the guy in the ski mask. So he's the one who has been hurting everybody. And Elliot was just like 
part of his plan, whatever. And he's hurting Nora because that's the only way he can hurt Patch because, because of his like, condition he has a body but he like can't feel sensations but he can still feel emotions so instead of trying to physically hurt patch jules aka shauncey is trying to emotionally hurt patch by physically hurting nora who he seems to care about jules is like i bet you're starting to wish you'd never met patch you wish he'd never fallen in love with you go on laugh at the position he's put you in Laugh at your own bad choices. Hearing Jules talk about Patch's love filled me with irrational hope. What? We have had not a single lovely conversation at all. She stabs Jules with a scalpel, but he's immortal, so it doesn't matter. And no one knows where V is. Poor V. <laughs> oh my God. So when she finally like is cornered by Jules, she is like, if I die and sacrifice myself, Patch will become human and you will die and it'll all be okay. And so she throws herself off of the school. Okay, so apparently Jules died, but um, somehow she managed to live because he didn't accept her sacrifice. And what good is a body if I can't have you? Did I miss the part where they like got nice to each other? Because they've been so shitty to each other this whole time. And like, there is no romance. This is just like them being physically attracted to each other and then just being assholes to each other. So I'm intrigued. Oh my God. And because he didn't accept her sacrifice and become a human, he became a guardian angel. <laughs> I'm sure we're gonna get answers in the next book, but basically everything seems to be okay. And Patch is her guardian angel now and is also helping install a security system to her home. What? <laughs> On we go. Hi everyone, same day outfit change because I want my window open for fresh air, but it's chilly. So if you hear noises, I live in a big city. I'm moving on to Crescendo. I have no idea what could possibly, what could possibly be going on next. So first of all, I'm looking at Storygraph. It said that this is set to be a major motion picture. Did that ever happen? But here is the what's going on in Crescendo. Nora should have known her whole life wouldn't stay perfect for long. Despite, oh no. Despite starting a relationship with her bad boy guardian angel, Patch. Shh. <laughs> and surviving an attempt on her life, things are not looking up. Patch is starting to pull away and Nora can't figure out if it's for her best interest or if his interest had shifted to her arch enemy, Marcy Miller. <laughs> not to mention, Nora is haunted by images of her father and starting to become obsessed with finding out what really happened to him that night he left for Portland and never came home. Portland, Maine, not Portland, Oregon. The farther Nora delves into the mystery of her father's death, the more she comes to question if her Nephilim bloodline has something to do with it, as well as why she seems to be in danger more than the average girl when she has a guardian angel. Since Patch isn't answering her questions, she has to start finding the answers on her own. But when she finds them, will she be able to count on Patch? Or are things he's hiding from her darker than she can imagine? I'm sorry, but despite having a relationship with her bad boy guardian angel, Patch, <laughs> so good. <laughs> I don't know why this is cracking me up. I'll tell you more later, but just no one can know you came from Maine. No one. <laughs> so the prologue is like, the I assume the day that her father died and so we're seeing from Harrison's point of view her dad's name is Harrison and so yeah he made some kind of deal where when she we assume this is Nora when she turns 16 someone's gonna come for her and take her away where you'll never find her and so now he has to run and cover his tracks and no one can know he's from Maine there's some sort of secret society Harrison put oh wait oh I thought you might like to know that she's grown up healthy and strong we named her Nora oh my god so maybe Nora maybe Harrison isn't Nora's biological father maybe Nora is being raised by a normal family and this guy who he's meeting secretly is her real dad oh shit the guy is like, I don't want to know her name. I've done everything in my power to stamp it out of my mind. I don't want to know anything about her. I want my mind washed of any trace of her. So I've got nothing to give that bastard. What? And so yeah, somebody is like, where is she? And he gets 
shot. Harrison is shot. A young man is dragging him down the alley. So yeah, he died. He was shot by some person looking for Nora. And that was 14 months ago, back to present day. So yeah, this Marcy is just a classic bully, mean girl. What, what do I gotta say? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? What is this train of thought? <laughs> what? Oh goodness. So she said, I love you. He didn't answer back she's freaking out yeah she's upset that he can't feel things physically blah 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 and he's like i have to control myself i can't be with you the way that i want Ugh. if i give them cause to think i'm even remotely in love with you they'll send me to hell forever oh no hey updates i think so, so her mom's old friend is moving back to town and I guess she used to play with her son when they were both five. So they were like, hey, yay, Scott is back. Let's have dinner. Turns out Scott's like a juvenile delinquent. Like something's really wrong with him. He has a weird ass temper. He might be able to do mind control. I don't know. More on Scott later, but put a pin in that. And then she, Nora's been having really weird dreams and she just had one that was like, it seemed like a memory in the p time of the pilgrims. One of the vassals, like a Nephilim or whatever, is Marcy's dad. So is Marcy also like Nora, a Nephilim? You get, you get what I'm saying? Maybe. Also in summer school, Nora and Marcy have to be partners for eight weeks. I can say with confidence, I have no idea what's going on. Scott is Nephilim, Nephili. Nephili. He's half fallen angel, um, which apparently means that they're all evil. I don't, I don't know, but there's a secret sus blood society of these Nephilim who are stirring up trouble, and there was like a bar fight, and now Patch is weirdly attached to Marcy, and Marcy's dad might be a Nephilim. I don't know, it's just like a lot of angels hanging out in shady, pool halls. V is dating Patch's fallen angel friend Nixon, Rick, Rickson, Rixum, who's supposed to be Irish. I don't know. So I'm going to check in when I have like more information, but even, even Nora's mom is like, please stay away from Scott. He's weird as fuck. So I don't know. And then Nora like completely broke it off with Patch. And she specifically said the words, I don't want you to be my guardian angel anymore. And apparently that just like broke the spell. I don't know. So like now he's not her guardian angel anymore. I, like I said, no idea. No idea. <laughs> like this is the media that we were raised with. V wants to get a glazed donut and immediately it's like, ah. This is just how media was. So much media, like mainstream was growing up. <sighs> I just don't understand. I don't understand. <laughs> so then she gets this weird envelope with a ring in it, and apparently the ring belongs to the black hand who killed her father. What's with this Disney font? <laughs> and now her dad might be alive because she saw someone who looked like him, and she was like, no, that must be a hallucination. But now she's thinking maybe he's still alive, and there was a closed casket funeral. Can he die? What if he's immortal? Edward Cullen wishes. Oh my God, going to the computer lab at school to check Facebook and look at Perez Hilton. Oh, the nostalgia. Goodness gracious, where do I begin? So yeah, I guess Patch did kiss Marcy. So oops, because remember every time that she touches her, his like where his angel wings are supposed to be, she gets one of his memories. So she saw him kiss Marcy. He was in one of her dreams. They were like about to hook up and then she saw that memory and she was like, never mind, I still hate you. And then she gets a note from him, but she smells it and it's got weird perfume on it. And then she like gets knocked out. So she got drugged and then she got locked in the library alone and somebody was chasing her and it sounded like her dad. But the last time she saw her dad, which I didn't mention, but she ran into her dad and he like attacked her. 
kind of. So she decided to run away from him. As she's running away, she's trying to get home. Because she's drugged, she's driving erratically, so she gets picked up by the detective that's been at the end of all of her phone calls whenever she has like an intruder or whatever. Um, and there's never any evidence. Remember, like she had a break in and then everything was fine. So he just doesn't trust her at all and is like sure that she's behind the weird stuff going on because Jules, remember, Jules died. And so even though we know that he was like a crazy Nephilim person, they just saw him as a high school kid. And so he, the detective is suspecting her. What else? I don't know. I guess that's it for now. She's researching the black hand and that's all. Oh, I relocated because I needed to snack. Apparently, Patch's old nickname is the Black Hand, and he got that was his nickname back in the days when we took jobs as mercenaries for the French king. 18th century Black Ops. Enjoyable stint. Good money. <laughs> So yeah, he, I mean, we knew that he's an angel and so he's old, but like, yeah, he is. He's a very old man who apparently wears $400 jeans and that's why his butt looks so good. I don't know, man, this is not, I'm not interested in like any part of the plot, like the whole romance part of the plot, not very into it. The whole who killed her dad thing. It's too confusing and like, I don't really care. I don't really like any of the characters. Her best friend is shitty, I gotta say like they're sh to each other like ev everyone involved there's not a single character and her mom is like never home so she's this teenager just living by herself i don't know i don't know man this is a very this book is very boring i will continue but and apparently the archangels are like pieces of shit <laughs> so off i go okay so the reason why marcy hates nora is because nora's mom has been sleeping with Marcy's dad since they were like in fifth grade. Goodness gracious. So actually Patch got reassigned and now he's Marcy's guardian angel because yes, Marcy's dad is a Nephilim. And now that Marcy is turning 16, she's in danger of being sacrificed or whatever the fuck. I still don't understand this whole thing. Like fallen angels can take over the a human body but they need to be nephilia i don't understand but anyway um now he has to guard marcy because apparently the arc archangels overheard nora say that she loved patch and so that night they were like switch boy but now he's like semi dating her so like that's weird just be a normal guardian angel my man oh i'm sorry no because if you sacrifice the female descendant of a nephilim you can become human that's right that's what the whole last book was about i'm sorry i'm here now i'm here and she point blank asked patch did you kill my dad and he didn't answer this is just getting weirder and weirder so now i don't even know Nora broke into Scott's apartment trying to find any information about the black hand. He got really pissed, came to her house, tried to stab her. So the police came and took him away. But he's like, no, if I get locked up and I can't run away, the black hand is going to kill me. Like the black hand has been chasing me my whole life, blah, 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 blah. And then Nora went to Patch's apartment, found a bomb. She got out of the apartment before it exploded. Then she decides to go to the boardwalk with V just for a fun night out when the police call and they're like, hey, we got to come pick you up because Scott bent the bars and climbed out of jail. So he's coming to probably kill you and there are 30 pages left. I have no idea where this is going. <laughs> okay, now her dad is talking to her through their minds and apparently the truth is in Rickson's angel scars. It was Rickson. Oh, this is awkward. <laughs> I knew it. So yes, Harrison Gray is not her biological father. It is Hank Miller. AKA Marcy's dad is Marcy, her sister. So in order to try to hide Nora, because he knew that like any daughter of his would when she turned 16 become one of those, like you could be sacrificed by the fallen angels kind of thing. He decided to hide her by asking his best friend Harrison to take Nora and raise her as his own. So now Rickson is taking her someplace, I assume to sacrifice her to try and get, to try to become a human. He's the one who planted the bomb he did everything rickson 
the sweet Irish boy did everything. And now she's like running through the fun house, trying to get out because apparently the fallen angels built the boardwalk carnival in Maine. Uh, wait, what? That was a very long scene. So Nora gets shot, Scott got shot, Scott apologizes for being insane. Um, Rickson shot both of them, but I guess they're okay. Patch is apparently not the black hand. Patch. <laughs> So Patch comes in to be like, oh my god, I thought you were dead. I'm so happy you're alive. And Nora's like, where is Rickson? And Patch says, I sent him to hell. He's never coming back. <laughs> what? I've gone rogue, Nora. As soon as the Archangels figure it out, they'll come looking for me. You were right. I don't really care about breaking the rules. <laughs> Nora says, are you crazy? Crazy about you. <laughs> This is so bad. So apparently him stepping in to save her when Rickson was trying to shoot her was like against the rules because he's not her guardian angel anymore. So he's not allowed to save people who aren't under his, you know, whatever. And um, so he broke he broke the rules anyway. So now he's like, fuck it, I'm, I'm rogue. I've gone rogue. So Nora's like, so where does this leave us? And he says, together. We fight a lot, Nora said, but we also make up a lot. Patch reached for my hand. <laughs> Stop. So he gives her a ring that, okay, so like Nora gave him a ring in the beginning to be like, I love you, I want you to have something of mine. So he took it and he engraved it and gave it back to her. And on the inside, there are two names, Nora and Jev. Jev, that's your real name? <clears throat> Nobody's called me that in a long time. <laughs> I'm dead. So they go to the amusement park again to because like since fallen angels built the boardwalk, archangels don't like to go there. So they're like finally able to have a moment where the archangels aren't watching them. And so Patch is finally able to say I love you and then sees the angel. <laughs> what? <laughs> Who's the black hand? Hank Miller. Her biological father, who is very disappointed in her for fraternizing with the enemy, aka fallen angels, and also she killed his dear friend, Shauncey, aka Jules. And that's the end of book two. The next book, which I will not be reading today, Silence. <laughs> and these books, by the way, keep getting longer, like not significantly longer, but longer nonetheless. That book was a bust, like that book wasn't good at all. Um, once again, it's like the characters aren't compelling. I don't feel any chemistry with any character and I don't really understand what's going on. Like it seems like everyone's kind of a bad guy. Like the archangels are a little nutty. The Nephilim are also kind of evil. The fallen angels are like not organized. They're just around. And Patch just wants to be a human. I don't really get it. I don't really get it, but... <sighs> We'll see. I'll see you later. Hello, it's a new day. Um, I spent the morning doing some work for Kurt. Uh, there will be a link in the description box as always, but um, my husband made a really wonderful service. If any of you guys have issues with your tabs and you want to have a more organized, customizable browsing experience, like if you're big into studying or if you have just like a lot of work to do, uh, always linked down below. It's called Mirror. Um, so I was doing some social media stuff for them, but now I'm going to dive in. I have about three hours to kill before I have to leave the house. Um, I'm going to start reading reading Silence. Um, I wanted to read what it says on Storygraph. This is so far the longest book. Soon to be a major motion picture. Why is it teasing me? Okay, so Silence. Nora Gray can't remember anything from the past five life-changing months. What? After the initial shock of waking up in a cemetery and being told that she has been inexplicably, inexplicably missing for weeks, she tries to get her life back on track. So she goes to school, hangs with her best friend V, and dodges her mom's creepy new boyfriend. But there's this voice in the back of her head, an idea that she can almost reach out and touch. Visions of angel wings and unearthly creatures that have nothing to do with the life she knows, and an unshakable feeling that a part of her is missing. Then, <laughs> then Nora crosses paths with a sexy stranger with whom she feels a mesmerizing connection. He seems to hold all the answers, and her heart, 
Every minute she spends with him feels more and more intense until she realizes she could be falling in love again. What? So, what? The ending of the last book was her like figuring shit out, finding out that her dad killed her dad. Um, and I guess, I guess we're gonna start off with a little bit of amnesia, a clever, a clever trick. So I think my, thinking about it as I was falling asleep last night, um, my issue with Crescendo was there was no clear goal. Like at first it felt like the point of this plot was that they can't be together like this star-crossed lovers thing where the archangels are trying to tear them apart but then we don't really ever meet the archangels and we don't really understand like how are they watching things how do they just call him up for meetings and get him in trouble like it it was just kind of very vague and then there was this whole thing with the black hand i don't know like it just kind of felt very like i'm not exactly sure where this is going um so i think that's especially why the last book was quite it wasn't boring but it was just like what are we doing guys like let's stop going to the movies stop going to the beach let's figure some stuff out you know but now she has amnesia and i'm so excited i just read a book about a person who has amnesia and forgot their love so I'm just, tis the season, I suppose. So off we go. The prologue is good. So I guess the thing, oh, well, let me just tell you what's happening. So at the end of the last book, Nora got taken by her birth father, Hank, who is a Nephilim. And he is like the head of the evil underground. So I guess what's like bothering me here is that the books that I read, like the half angel people were still good, like shadow hunters, but here they're apparently evil. So he's like the head mob boss, okay? And he kidnapped Nora. So now flash forward to a couple days later and he's in the cemetery making a deal with Patch. And Patch is basically like hardcore, like touch my girl and I'll kill you, blah, 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 blah. Basically what Hank wants Patch to do is to join the fallen angels again and like spy on them and tell Hank everything that the fallen angels are doing because he wants to take them all down because he is sick of being possessed once every year for like a month and like honestly I get it so I think that's the thing that I'm struggling with is that the Nephilim are the bad guys right they're the evil mobster people but on the other hand the fallen angels are also like I wouldn't want my body to be taken over for a month either you know and it's never really explained like why do they need to do that it's kind of weird and so that's kind of why I'm having trouble connecting with this story is that I just I'm not sure I understand the world um so anyway Patch all he cares about is getting Nora free so he makes a deal where Hank is allowed to rip out his wings. So Patch gets his guardian angel wings ripped off in exchange for Hank promising that by the end of the summer, he will set Nora free. And in the meantime, he's like starving her and torturing her. Anytime that Patch doesn't listen to what he says, he like makes a phone call and is like, give her nothing but water for 48 hours kind of thing which patch is freaking out about right so um yeah patch gets his wings ripped off and then nora's mom calls and we realize that nora's mom is fully convinced that nora's been kidnapped and doesn't know where she is and hank is like yes he's going like full liam neeson like i will find whoever took her don't worry when he's the one who took her i just don't know i just don't know and now we fast forward to three months later three months after patch has been de-winged and her memory got wiped all the way back to april so she hasn't even met patch yet her memory is completely gone anything that happened in summer gone it's now september she's been gone she went missing in june but she can't remember anything since april oh my gosh and everybody had their memories wiped a little bit like v remembers everything except that she was dating rickson so that's weird. Does anybody know Patch? Okay, so the only thing that she kind of remembers is she just knows that she gets this weird feeling when she thinks of the color black. <laughs> and so she decides to go back to the cemetery because <clears throat> for some reason no one is watching her. She just got abducted for 11 weeks and nobody cares. So anyway, she sneaks out of the house, goes to the cemetery. She finds a black feather and when she picks it up, a memory stirs. 
Angel, I seemed to hear a smooth voice whisper, you're mine. Of all the ridiculous, confusing things, I blushed. I looked around just to make sure the voice wasn't real. I haven't forgotten you. He's trying to break through whatever amnesia Hank put on her. He's breaking through. Oh my gosh, and then Nora comes home and she finds a note on her bed that says like, just because you're home doesn't mean you're safe. And she goes and she shows her mom and the paper is blank. That was fast. <laughs> she just went to sleep and woke up in like a dream state. Patch is there. So that was easy. <laughs> but of course he's like, I gave you up to save your life. Please don't come looking for me. It's better if you don't know anything that happened. Go away, you can't be here, blah, blah, blah. Oh my God, so now he like erased the memory of the dream. He told her like, listen, I have a plan. I'm not gonna make a mistake. The stakes are too high. I love you. If I lose you, I lose everything, blah, blah, blah. And she's not gonna remember it. So she wakes up and she's got nothing, nothing. Except for a zebra print shirt dress, what? I'm sorry, your daughter just got back from being kidnapped for 11 weeks. You couldn't tell your new boyfriend that maybe hey we should like hold off on this for a little bit so that she can like chill she's literally been home for like three days maximum come on mom okay now she's hallucinating about a girl in a cage telling her not to give him the necklace he thinks you have the necklace if he gets it he can't be stopped he took my wings i can't get home what? Okay, apparently Patch gave Nora a necklace and it was Marcy's. And so now Marcy wants the necklace back. But now she's also trying to be friends with Nora because they both are pissed that Marcy's dad is dating Nora's mom. So they're like making a friendship, but also like Marcy's still kind of a piece of shit. Okay, so Patch gave her a necklace. Good God. So Nora runs out of the restaurant where she was being forced to watch her mom and Marcy's dad go on a date and she hated it. So she ran out and she ran to a seven. 11 that was getting robbed but really it was getting attacked by fallen angels because one of the guys who works at 7-eleven is apparently an nephilim who turned 16 so now they can like the fallen angel can get him to swear fealty to them and so once a month or for one month a year they're able to take over his body or whatever she witnesses this and because she's a witness they're gonna kill her but of course patch shows up with his his real name Jev. He's clearly like one of the fallen angels, like he's infiltrated the fallen angels like Hank asked him to, but because Nora was in danger, he stabs his fellow colleague with a tire iron. <laughs> Jev, aka Patch, drives her halfway home and as she's fighting him to be like tell me what's going on blah, 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 she touches his back where his scar is so she gets sucked into one of his memories and it's a memory with hank and apparently the girl that they kidnapped the one who she had this weird vision of that was like the necklace blah, blah, blah. she's an archangel who they somehow captured and sawed off her wings and so now patch has to bring them her necklace or else or something like that but he gave the necklace he doesn't say it but we're 99 percent sure that he gave the necklace to nora but nora doesn't remember anything so it's like the perfect plan but marcy is learning about what hank is and like wants to kind of because she's apparently evil she wants to like be more a part of that world or something so she's trying to track down the necklace hence why she was asking nora about it um is that it yeah but she's she's putting it all together together hmm. honestly like shame on Nora's mom for even being with this crap so Hank they find Nora after she's run off right Hank is like I have my own hormon hormonal drama queen under my roof this girl just got kidnapped and was abducted and lost her memories for five months and you're calling her a hormonal drama queen fuck you like why were parents in early 2000s media, the dumbest people on the planet, like the worst. And now her mom is lying to her, telling her that she kind of saw this boy, but Nora Loki wasn't into him and was always making excuses not to see him. So don't bother trying to remember Peter, maybe. Whoa. I hope the plot twist is that the mom turns out to be evil too, because there's no way that a mother is this stupid. Back from class, Scott, 
Parnell coming in clutch. He ran away. He got shot, ran away to New Hampshire, right? Gifted her a Volkswagen because he was a jerk, because that's a normal thing. Anyway, we run into Scott. I don't know how, but we run into Scott and he catches her up with what the heck is an affilium anyway? Um, she understands the whole like immortal thing, blah, blah, blah. I don't think he actually says the word angel though. He just says immortal. So she's like, okay, weird, but gotcha. And then he's like, I've narrowed it down. I'm pretty sure the black hand is Hank Miller. So he's got something going on up there. So now she's freaking out and she just found out that her mom is like definitely planning on marrying Hank. So that's not good. Are you sure Hank is the black hand? No offense, but he doesn't fit my picture of an underground militarist or an immortal man. He runs the most successful car dealership in town. Why would he care what's going on in the world of Nephilim? <laughs> okay, so kind of a weak argument but the reason the fallen angels take over the nephilim's bodies for a month is just so that they can have human feelings like physical sensation this seems like a lot of work i don't know no only for two weeks it's only for two weeks and then scott gives us the most crucial piece of information who patch is good boy hello everyone it's been a couple days I am very ill. There's some kind of, not COVID, but some kind of weird flu cold thing going around. Um, Kurt was sick for a few days and I caught it. So um, I ended up reading, I finished Silence, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm feeling much better. It's just difficult to talk. I finished Silence, but I did not film my reac reactions to it. So I'm going to just catch you up so that then now we can finish this damn series. I have like 500 more pages left. I still have no idea what's going on. I just, I feel like, so the Nephilim are bad because they're like mobsters, but the fallen angels are also bad because they're like robbing people of their bodies. But then the archangels are also just vaguely bad. Like, I'm just not sure just not sure. So here's where I left you. Patch comes and picks her up. She decides to like, she and Scott went on this like reconnaissance mission to try and look at Hank's warehouse or something and they didn't find anything. And so she went back by herself and Patch came to her rescue, whatever. They have a moment. She gets all of her memories back because she touches Patch's back you know she gets all of the information including like how patch traded his wings for her safety blah 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 coming out of that getting all of her memories back for like five months her first question is so were you and marcy ever a thing girl mom is maybe probably definitely being mind controlled by hank but then her mother these are all my notes okay then her mom gets in an accident she fell down the stairs so now it's just her and hank hank is looking after nora while her mom recovers from this mysterious incident but then nora gets in a car accident with hank and we learn later allegedly that Hank gave her a blood transfusion in order to save her life and now that makes her nephilim so she needs to like take his place or something like if he dies then she takes up his like place as I don't fucking know but then who kills Hank maybe Nora she shoots Hank. There's this whole thing. Dabria's around. I don't know, guys. I have no idea. And then Scott at the end is like, there's going to be a war. So now Nora has to join the side of the Nephilim to fight the angels. I don't, I don't know. I don't understand. Like I partially, it was because I was sick. Partially it's because this book doesn't make any sense and it's not even really funny anymore. Let me find you the last book. Hold on. Finale. What a great name for the last book of a series. Okay. Nora is more certain than ever that she is in love with Patch. Fallen angel or no, he's the one for her. Her heritage and destiny may mean that they are fated to be enemies, but there is no turning her back on him. Now, Nora and Patch must gather their strength to face one last perilous trial. Old enemies return, new enemies are made, and a friend's ultimate betrayal 
threatens the peace Pachinora so desperately want. The battle lines are drawn, but which side are they on? And in the end, are there some obstacles even love can't conquer? I just don't understand. I don't get it. I don't know what's going on. Oh my god. All right. I'm back. I am mostly healed. Hi guys, I'm feeling much better, but this is as I'm like screaming at you. I'm happy to be able to speak again. I'm also, I get out of breath really quickly. I read about 50% of Finale, which I still can't get over is the title of this book. For some reason, I don't mind this one. I feel like I have given up on trying to understand what's happening and I'm just going with the flow. And there's an introduction of a new character that I think is kind of interesting. I've given up. Like, expectations out the window. I'm in higher spirits than I was in the last video, that's for sure. Finale. I'll go through my notes in a second, but basically, yes. Hank named Nora his heir. So he dies. Nora killed him, which nobody knows this except for like Patch and maybe Scott. I don't know. Now, Girlie, who became Nephilim by blood transfusion, so she doesn't even have like the superpowers that Nephilim have. This 17 year old girl is now leading a race of people into war against the fallen angels. A war that's been going on for centuries. Nora is in command, okay? All right, so there's a lot of moving parts. First of all, the war. Um, doesn't make much sense. It's like they're just waiting for the war to start, but like, who says go? Like, when when does this war start, you know? Um, they're all waiting for the month that uh, the fallen angels can take over the Nephilim bodies, but it seems like that month has started and like there hasn't been any action. So when is this war starting? How are they just gonna fight? Who? what like what is what is this war is what i'm trying to understand but before we can even go into that nora has a lot of stuff to do number one she has to convince everybody that she's not in love with patch anymore because she can't be head of the nephilim but also dating their arch enemy a fallen angel so in order to not con in order to convince the nephilim that she's loyal to them she has to pretend to break up with patch and then fake date Dante, who is a new character that I just don't really understand. Um, he seems like a good guy. He's an affiliate, he's very loyal, um, and he is also her personal trainer because he is teaching her how to be strong because she wasn't born with her strength. She also is dealing with Marcy moved in with her because she doesn't want to stay with her mom. I don't know. That's it off the top of my head, but let me let me go through my notes, okay? So, oh. First of all, Scott swore to Nora's non-biological father, Harrison, the one who died. He swore an oath that he would protect Nora. That was like, he kind of fucked up and Scott believes he had a hand in Harrison being killed in the first place, which he kind of did. That's how he's paying back for it, is he's gonna protect Nora forever. But then he's also like not in the book a whole lot because he's out like dating Marcy slash V. I don't know. Oh, duh. Biggest part of the oath, when Hank made her his heir, she had to swear an oath to him. And so if she doesn't lead the Nephilim, so AKA if somebody replaces her as leader, like if the Nephilim don't accept her and they vote or whatever to replace her, she um, dies, it's the terms of the oath, and not only her, but her mom dies. How did her mom get wrapped into this oath? I don't know. But so that's why she's like very set on being Hank's heir. There's just a lot, I'm, I'll put some, some great quotes here for ya. Oh my God, and then there is a cop just like putting his siren on for funsies every once in a while. You done? Speaking of cops, the detective that's like always up in Nora's business might have become a Nephilim or something, or he might've been taken over by a fall. I don't know. There's something sus about detective Blasso or whatever his name is. Anyway, speaking of the oath, Nora wasn't the only one to take an oath. Dante did. 
And Dante's oath is that if Nora doesn't go to war and win it, Dante dies. So, because Nora was like, ooh, loophole, I only have to lead the Nephilim. I never said lead them into war. So she's trying to just like not start the war, like avoid it at all costs. But Dante's like, ooh, ooh sorry. Um, if we don't do the thing and win, I die. Um, so there's that. And then at the end of one of their training sessions, Dante gives Nora blue Gatorade. And she drinks it and she's like, and uh, it's not Gatorade, it's devil craft. It's some kind of like steroid basically for the Nephilim. And so she gets all of their powers. Like she can jump really high and stuff. The guy who makes it, whose name is Blakely, he is working on a super drug that will not only make the Nephilim just as strong as the fallen angels, but it will kill the fallen angels, AKA kill Patch. And here, here's what she says. She says, my sympathy was with the Nephilim because they weren't fighting for a dominion or other virtuous ambition. They were fighting for their freedom. I got it. I admired it. I'd do anything to help, but I didn't want Blakely or Dante putting the fallen angel population at risk. If fallen angels were wiped off the face of the earth, Patch would go with them. I wasn't willing to lose Patch, and I'd do whatever it took to make sure his species survived. So, yeah, now there's that. Um, so she has to, like, choose her loyalty. Is she going to tell Patch about the devil crap? I don't know. And then, oh my god, and then at one point, Blakely possesses Marcy's body, which is kind of weird. He stabs Nora with even though like they're on the same side which i just don't understand but anyway he stabs nora with a poisoned knife they get the antidote but then the antidote makes her crave the devil craft drug um i don't i don't know this is where i started to kind of like the cold medicine was hitting falling asleep um and then i put the book down this is where we are right now Marcy throws a Halloween party. These girls, there is literally a war about to erupt and they are just constantly going to the devil's handbag, their local nightclub, and throwing parties. And so, like, can you focus is what I am asking. Marcy, who is now living with Nora and Nora's mom, wants to throw a Halloween party. Oh, Patch sneaks into the party. They start making out. Nora's mom finds them, fucking hates Patch screams and kicks him out. So now Nora is without her guardian angel boyfriend and another fallen angel comes into their Halloween party and he's like, Nora Gray, swear your fealty to me. Off we go, we got 200 pages left. <laughs> Sorry, which just reminds me, Remember when I was reading Crave and there was a fight scene that was over 100 pages? This book, The War, not this fight scene, the war hasn't even started yet and we only have 200 pages left. It's not mathing. Let's go see. Also, Dabria is back and like allegedly helping Patch and Patch trusts her, but Nora is going all like really creepy possessive girlfriend and like hates Dabria and will not trust her will not touch her with a 10 foot pole. So she escaped from the fallen angel because she mind tricked him and then stabbed him. So good job. Okay, so now that they have devil craft, they are strong enough to possess fallen angels. So that's what they're gonna try today in training. <laughs> Uh-oh, so she asks Dante to like use his spy network to spy on Dabria and he's like, ooh, girly, I've already been doing it because we were spying on Patch and I have some photos you should see. And, uh, that was last night. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, so there was this whole thing with this guy named Pepper who was bothering Nora because he was being blackmailed. But it, it, I'm not even gonna explain it. But basically, Dante was going behind everybody's back and working with the fallen angels because he doesn't think the Nephilim are going to win and that he was being put under investigation because the archangels knew about him and Blakely making this devil craft stuff and so instead of getting you know sent to hell or whatever he just joined so now Dante is the bad guy oh and Nora can mind speak with animals which is fun
Ugh, so he's not going to die from the blood oath. What a bummer. And he apparently tied up Scott and Patch. So she's all alone. Okay, so now Dante and Nora have to duel because now he wants to take over the Nephiliums and then lead them into war, but then betray them and like let the fallen angels win. So now Nora has to fight Dante. I'm sorry, my voice is going. So Nora is talking to Patch and she's like, if the duel happens, we'll fight with guns or swords, your preference, but I'd strongly suggest pistols. It'll be easier for you to learn to shoot than to sword fight, Patch said calmly, clearly not hearing the distress in my voice. <laughs> and now that they have like solved Pepper's problem of like who the blackmailer is or something, or they've like promised to deal with Dante, whatever, Pepper is going to get all of the feathers of the fallen angels and that's how they're gonna win the war is they're just gonna burn all of the feathers and send them all to hell. And then once they win the war, Nora's done with her oath and her and Patch can live happily ever after. So she announces the duel in front of the Nephilim and he's like, but we're dating. And it just reminds me of the Legally Blonde scene. You bitch. You see, I thought you said friend. Chuck is just a friend. Oh, okay. <laughs> you bitch. <laughs> oh my God. So now they got all the feathers. They put it in a pile and they're going to set it on fire. Problem, they forgot to grab Patch's feather out of the pile. So now Nora is like, oh my God, we gotta find Patch's feather because he's gonna die. And then Marcy's like, it's too late. I can't put out the fire. And it turns out Marcy has betrayed her because she wants to be head of the Nephilim. She's bummed that her dad picked Nora instead of her. And also like Marcy found out that Nora did kill Hank because she did to be fair. And so she's like, you killed my dad. I'm never gonna trust you again. I hope that Patch's feather burns. Oh my God. So doesn't matter that they burned all the feathers because somebody just went down and opened up the gates of hell. So the fallen angels just came right back. So now her and V, who has been roped in and learned, she knows what's going on. Her and V are gonna go close the gates of hell. And uh, so now, now we have the war and there is 50 pages left of this book and Patch is in hell. He is MIA. And oh, Rickson's back. Scott just got stabbed. She possesses Dante and then she kills herself, AKA Dante. And then her soul gets like spat out back into her body. Dante is dead. Scott is dead. All right, what the fuck is up with Detective Basso? Oh my God, Detective Basso is an arc angel. And his whole thing is that he came to earth to like do everything that Nora just did basically. So he was just like around, not doing anything. And Nora was carrying this world on her back. And he's like, thanks all of your hard work bye and patch is back rickson is dead i don't know how that's different from being in hell but now he's dead <laughs> be my girl nora be my everything Ugh. they did a blood oath to each other which is just not sanitary oh my god and and he's like oh my god my hand it's tingling from where I made this cut. And they're like, wait, but you can't feel physical things. And I guess Detective Basso, his parting gift was that he made Patch able to feel. I don't know if he's a human, but he's able to feel. Let's read the epilogue. We're done with this goddamn book. Wait, 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 wait. So in the epilogue, V is getting married to, to a guy named Gavin, who is a human and V is now immortal? Like, I guess someone made her Nephilim? She didn't tell her husband? I'm... Okay. <gasps> Guys! The last sentence of this book, I can't believe. So it's, it's V's wedding, and she sees Patch across the chapel, and he looks really good, and she's like, I must have you. And they leave the wedding and go back to their hotel room. He, she's like undoing his tie and she's like, oh, you dress to impress, I said approvingly. No angel, he leaned in, his teeth softly grazing my ear. 
I undress to impress. And that's the end. That's the last word you're gonna leave us with. Something so corny, so toe-curlingly corny. All right, so I read 1,409 pages. Do I have any idea what happened? No. The fallen angels were defeated. I don't know if I said that. Dante was defeated. And because of that, he made a blood oath. So all the fall, I don't know. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, that's what I read. I will say that this one, even though I didn't understand what was happening, I felt like this one, the action was like pretty consistent throughout. The two middle books, man, I don't know. Um, I don't know. But um, anyway, let me know your thoughts. Was this a part of your childhood? I really missed this boat. I'd never read these. It wasn't horrendous, but it also just like wasn't super fun. Um, I can understand like if you were of age and reading these within like the Twilight era, I could see how you could like them. <laughs> but um, mm, I'm... I'm mm. So yeah, let me know your thoughts. Tell me about, what did I miss? Tell me about Patch. Um, what is it about him? Why did Scott have to die? I'm still reeling. I, I still have no idea what's going on. What happened to the movie? Is there gonna be a movie? If you have information about the movie, let me know because from what I can tell, they casted it. So I'm interested, but anyway, um, I'm going to leave you here. And once again, thank you so much to Blinkist for sponsoring this, for summarizing things in an actual, like, cohesive and short and understandable way, unlike me. Um, there will be a link down in the description box if you want to check it out. You can get a seven day free trial plus 60% off of your Blinkist membership, uh, Blinkist premium. So yeah, all that information will be down below. Thank you so much to Blinkist and I will see you guys next time. As always, let me know what I should be reading next and it's been an honor. See you next time.